I'm going to welcome Charlotte Barker to chair this final session. We've had accessibility in employment, we've had accessibility in the built environment, and now it's accessibility and in information and services. Charlotte is the CEO of the Institute of Designers in Ireland, and that role involves driving professional standards in design and building strong connected communities. She's an inclusion champion and she uses her platform to reach, to break out, to break down barriers and ensure design is welcoming to all. So I'll hand you over to her capable hands. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Sorry to cut your coffee break short. Uh, thank you for having me, Aideen. Thank you to everybody from the NDA and the Centre for Excellence and Universal Design. Uh, I'm Charlotte Barker, so yes, Chief Executive of the IDI. Um, I am a middle-aged woman uh, with, with blonde hair and black rimmed glasses. I wear black pretty much all of the time because colour is overwhelming when you've worked in design for 20 years. So mostly you will, you will find me wearing black. Um, IDI collaborates with the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design on a range of activities to promote universal design in Ireland. So for example, this evening I will be going up to TU Dublin and Grange Gorman to present the Graduate Design Awards and we have a specific award in universal design so that we can continue to raise the profile of the importance of universal design through education. And next week we will be supporting the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform and Creative Ireland in launching Ireland's first ever design principles for government. This is a first step towards encouraging a citizen-centric approach to delivering the services that we use day to day, so very much in the heartland of universal design. So in line with the format conference, we will now have three presentations followed by a Q&A, so please do prepare your questions as we go and don't be shy. So first we will hear on screen from David Capozzi, who is a retired US federal executive and recent presidential appointee to the board of directors for Amtrak. Then we will hear from Elaine Howley, board director for Dublin Bus, as well as the regional coordinator with Sage Advocacy. Elaine will tell us more about the barriers to accessibility of public transport in Ireland. Eleanor Liston and Amy Collins will then bring us through the recently developed travel assistance scheme in Cork with Bus Aaron. And finally, we will hear from Susanna Laudin, Chief Research and Innovation Officer at Funka, a European-based market-leading consultancy focusing on web accessibility. So save your questions, please, until the end. And if you're watching online, feel free to send them your questions or remarks through. So now over to David on the video. I'm David Capozzi. For over 35 years, I've worked to make transportation more accessible for people with disabilities. I was a member of the legal team for the disability community that helped Congress craft the Americans with Disabilities Act, and I testified in support of its passage. Following the ADA's enactment, I chaired the Department of Transportation's advisory committee created to help develop DOT's ADA regulations. I was also the lead negotiator in a federal advisory committee that helped develop regulations for the Air Carrier Access Act. I served as National Advocacy Director for the Paralyzed Veterans of America and was Vice President of Advocacy for Easter Seals. I was the Executive Director of the Access Board from 2008 until my retirement from federal service in 2020. While there, I led the development of numerous guidelines and standards to implement the ADA and other federal laws. In April, President Biden nominated me to be one of eight members of Amtrak's board of directors. If confirmed, I'll be the first person with a disability on Amtrak's board. I'll begin by talking about the whole journey approach to transportation, but then spend the bulk of my presentation talking about promises that have been made through laws and regulations and do some fact checking after 32 years of ADA implementation to see which promises have been kept and which haven't. I'll then offer some concluding remarks. A whole journey approach includes going to and from a bus or rail stop, as well as waiting for and riding on a bus or rail car. A journey is made up of many parts and every part needs to be addressed to ensure a successful outcome. But in the U.S., we've learned that without laws and regulations that dictate accessibility requirements, pre-journey and return journey planning and training are tangential to those requirements. 
So that's where I'll focus my remarks. We have many forms of transportation in the US and those that are directly impacted by the ADA and its regulations include fixed route bus, paratransit, rapid rail, light rail, commuter rail, intercity rail, over the road buses, private transportation, infrastructure, and websites and apps. I'll first talk about vehicles and then discuss station requirements. Fixed route bus is a system of transporting people along a prescribed route according to a fixed schedule. The ADA requires that new fixed route vehicles must be accessible. If a transit agency purchases or leases used vehicles, they must demonstrate good faith efforts to buy accessible used vehicles. And if they remanufacture a vehicle, it must be accessible if its usable life is extended for five years or more. ADA paratransit is a required service provided by fixed route operators to individuals with disabilities who are unable to use accessible fixed route service because of their disability. People who have a specific impairment related condition that prevents them from getting to or from a stop are also eligible. If a person meets the eligibility criteria for some trips, but not others, they're eligible only for those trips for which they meet the criteria. Service is required for three quarters of a mile on either side of fixed routes and transit agencies can charge up to twice the equivalent bus or rail fare. Rapid rail, also known as heavy rail, metro or subway is generally found in urban areas. The requirements are the same as for fixed route bus systems regarding new used and remanufactured vehicles with the addition that at least one vehicle per train must be accessible. Light rail when compared to rapid rail systems typically carries fewer passengers and can operate in mixed traffic with automobiles. The requirements are the same as for rapid rail systems. Commuter rail is a rail system that pr primarily operates within a metropolitan area, connecting commuters to a central city from adjacent suburbs. The requirements are the same as for rapid and light rail systems, except remanufactured rail cars must be accessible if their usable life is extended for 10 years or more instead of five. Intercity rail is passenger train service that connects cities over longer distances than commuter trains. In the US, Amtrak is the primary intercity rail provider. It provides medium and long distance service in 46 of the 48 US states and to nine cities in Canada. The vehicle requirements are the same as for commuter rail. Special rules for single level passenger coaches and bi-level dining cars, including requiring a space to park and secure a wheelchair, providing a transfer seat, space to store a passenger's wheelchair, and an accessible restroom. Over the road buses are buses characterized by an elevated passenger deck located over a baggage compartment. Service can be fixed route or demand responsive, such as tour bus services. Accessible restrooms aren't required if it would result in a loss of seating capacity. For large fixed route operators like Greyhound, when they purchase vehicles, they must be accessible. Small operators can either purchase accessible vehicles or ensure that equivalent service is provided. Demand responsive operators must provide service on an accessible bus with 48 hour advance notice. Coverage of private transportation providers is complicated. The ADA covers private entities primarily engaged in transportation and private entities not primarily engaged in transportation separately. Private entities primarily engaged in transportation include taxi companies, tour operators, and airport shuttle services. Because their primary business is transportation, these companies have more obligations
and private entities who are not primarily engaged in transportation, such as hotel shuttle services or car rental agency shuttles. The requirements are more stringent for fixed route service than for demand responsive service and requirements depend on the passenger capacity of the vehicle. Infrastructure is more straightforward. Any new facility, including bus stops and shelters and rail stations are required to be accessible. For alterations that affect usability, the altered portion is required to be accessible to the maximum extent feasible. And when a primary function area of an existing facility is altered, the path of travel to the area and the bathrooms, telephones, and drinking fountains serving it must be made accessible with certain cost limitations. Not every existing rail station is required to be made accessible. Only key stations and rapid light and commuter rail systems are covered. Key stations are those with above average passenger boardings, transfer stations, interchange stations, end stations, and stations serving major activity centers. Key station improvements were to be completed by 1995. However, where extraordinarily expensive structural changes were required, rapid and light rail systems could seek a time extension until 2020. Commuter rail key stations could get extensions until 2010, and all Amtrak inner city rail stations were required to be made accessible by 2010. Even though there are accessibility standards and guidelines to follow for websites and web applications, in the US there are no formal laws to enforce them other than Section 508, which only applies to federal websites. However, in July, the Department of Justice announced its intent to establish regulations for website accessibility for state and local government agencies, and this would affect most transit operators. Now let's see what promises have been kept. In 1989, the year before the ADA was passed, 40% of fixed route buses were accessible. Today, 100% are. Fleets generally consist of low floor buses with ramps, which are easier to use and maintain than lifts. And this is probably the biggest ADA success story. Because paratransit use was the main method of transportation prior to the ADA, it's become hard to get people to switch over to accessible fixed route service. Transit operators try to get people to move from relying on paratransit to fixed route vehicles by using strategies like travel training programs. But paratransit service has grown rapidly and has resulted in large budgetary impacts. The cost of providing a paratransit trip can be 10 times more expensive than a fixed route trip. For example, a paratransit trip costs $57 in Denver. Some ways that transit operators have tried to contain costs include reducing their service area to the ADA requirement of within a three quarter mile corridor of fixed route services and by charging the allowable maximum of two times the equivalent bus or rail fare instead of a lower fee. In the year before the ADA was passed, 83% of rapid rail vehicles were accessible. Today, 100% are. For facilities, the picture, the picture isn't as bright, but federal help is on the way. In November 2021, President Biden signed a law which included $10 billion over 10 years to upgrade the accessibility of rapid light and commuter rail key stations over 900 stations or nearly 20% of all transit stations are not fully accessible today. In the year before the ADA was passed, 41% of light rail vehicles were accessible. Today, 92% are. In the year before the ADA was passed, 32% of commuter rail vehicles were accessible. Today, 82% are. They provided 20 years to 2010 for Amtrak to make its stations accessible, but Amtrak missed the deadline. Only about a quarter of the nearly 400 stations where Amtrak has or shares ADA responsibility currently comply with accessibility standards. 
As part of a 2020 settlement with the Department of Justice, Amtrak committed to bringing these stations into compliance and plans to spend about a billion dollars over the next six years to achieve that goal. And over the next 10 years, Amtrak intends to replace most of its, of its existing passenger rail car fleet. The law that I mentioned earlier provides Amtrak with $66 billion in funding over the next five years, the largest investment in passenger rail since the company's creation more than 50 years ago. From 1999 to 2012, about $99 million was provided to help private over-the-road bus operators phase in and comply with accessibility requirements. However, at the same time, numerous settlement agreements and consent decrees have been entered into with companies such as Greyhound and Megabus because of non-compliance. Since 2016, Greyhound has paid over $3 million to compensate victims of discrimination. Private rental car shuttle systems have entered into agreements with the Department of Justice, including Avis, Alamo, and National. We haven't progressed much in terms of providing accessible taxis. Most people with disabilities still need to call in advance for the few accessible taxis that exist. Going outside and expecting to hail an accessible taxi in most cities is simply not possible. Uber and Lyft have been sued in several states, challenging the ride-sharing services failure to make accessible vehicles available. Getting to and from bus stops and train stations remains challenging in many communities. Advocates have turned to the courts in cities around the country and class action lawsuits over sidewalk and curb ramp access issues have been settled in Baltimore, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. The city of New Orleans recently agreed to bring thousands of bus stops into compliance by 2031. The Department of Justice entered into a settlement agreement to improve the accessibility of the Champaign-Urbana, Illinois transit website and mobile applications and there was a recent settlement agreement between the Metropolitan Transit Authority of Harris County in Houston, Texas and blind transit riders about the accessibility of the transit agency's website and mobile application. In conclusion, what have we learned after 32 years of ADA implementation? First, there have been many successes. Vehicles of all types are much more accessible today than they were before the ADA. Facilities are becoming more accessible, but we still have more work to do in that area and more attention needs to be paid to information and communication channels like websites and apps. So despite the laws and regulations, it is still important that people with disabilities plan their journeys to ensure a successful outcome. I'll go here, this may be easier. Um, just to say thank you then to David. David has just joined us there live online from the US this morning, or this afternoon for us this morning for David. Um, so thank you very much, David. We've just had your presentation. David is gonna join us for the Q&A at the end of all of the presentations, but now I would like to hand across to Elaine, please, for the next presentation. Good afternoon. Um, I'm happy to be here today to share with you my own perception of the barriers to accessible public transport. I have impaired vision. I don't have the luxury of getting up in the morning and deciding, will I take the car? Will I go on the bike? Will I toddle down on the scooter this morning because the weather is nice? I have to rely fully on public transport. Right now, I'm concerned that despite Article 9 and commitments to universal design and despite, despite increased spending, the real day-to-day -day experience of people with disabilities on our public transport is not improving. In fact, it is getting worse. 
For me personally, the decision to remove yellow bus stops in favour of less costly grey ones creates an instant barrier and removes one of the most useful accessibility features in our increasingly grey streetscape. Unfortunately, my independence has been reduced in favour of less costly options and I now need to revert to asking people on the street where is the bus stop as I go around my community-based work. I'd like, you to, I'd like to invite you to come on a journey with me into a world where you wake up one morning and are told that no cars are allowed on the road. Just, just go with me on this. And you don't have access to a bike. So no cars and no bike. You have places to go, people to see, meetings to attend. Your only option is public transport. You leave your home and head towards the nearest train station. It's a long time since you got the train. On your way, you are surprised by the scene, which is different from how it used to be. The footpath that was once clutter-free and the domain of the pedestrian is now littered with wheelie bins and street furniture belonging to the local restaurant. <coughs> Excuse me. And you realize that your space is being invaded by a variety of silent anonymous shadows that brush, pa brush past you at speed and make you jump. What was that? Oh, it was an e-scooter. And then, a few seconds later, a bike. You tell the person on the bike that this is the footpath, and they reply, it's a cycle track now. So which is it? It was always the path. But then you spot a drawing, an outline of a bike on the ground, and you ask yourself, is it safe for me to be here? Would it be safe for my elderly family members to be here, or the blind guy that lives down the road? Where is your safe space now? This must be what they call shared space, and it simply is not safe. Is the pedestrian no longer the priority in the design manual for urban roads and streets? Surely this has not changed. Maybe it needs to change. Maybe it needs to be brought up to date with the current reality, and it certainly needs to be implemented as a blueprint. As you reach the pedestrian crossing, you cross, the, you cross at the signal, and whoosh, another brush with a speeding bundle. You jump in fright and say, it's the green man. And a moving shout says, shut up fatty, I'm on a bike, I can do what I like. It's true, it happened. You turn the corner, you discover that it's impossible to get to the station without going on the road. There's a car crossing, a parked across in front of the whole path, isn't there? It happens to be a guard the car. So you take your life in your hands and navigate your way onto the road knowing that you won't be seen by oncoming traffic. Ignoring the hooting horns, you do what you need to do. You have to get to your meeting and you manage to navigate safely back onto the path. Now stay with me for a sec. You know that you can ask the person at the desk about the side of the platform to be on and the next train. But no, hold on a second. We now have unmanned, or should I say unpeopled stations. So you must rely on your fellow passengers, again. You are stopped by a man who wonders if the incoming dart is going to hold her to Malahide because there was no announcement about that and he can't see the visual display. He tells you that he lived in Sydney for years and never had this problem because his local train station that had eight platforms announced every single incoming train and the stations it stopped at. He talked about how difficult it is in Dublin with Pearson Con where Pierce and Connolly are a disaster they don't tell you whether a train is a commuter or a dart. They don't tell you where it's going. He tells you of the day he missed a job interview because the announcements were incorrect. You both get on the train and what do you know? The location at each stop is a state secret. Not a word is to be heard. You tell your friend when it's his time to get off and you move on and get to your meeting. When you arrive, you talk to all of those present at your meeting and you tell them about the horrendous stressful travel experience you had through the pavements that are no longer safe. Your colleagues who also had to use public transport expressed concerns about the unsafe nature of the new bus stops, which required them to cross a busy cycle track to get on and off the bus. All agreed that this was incredibly unsafe and ask how such designs are being funded. Who would be responsible if a, a, a passenger getting on or off a bus had a collision with a cyclist? Others talked about uh, 
not lifts not working, not being repaired at stations and how they've been stranded numerous times, having traveled to and from many parts of Ireland, as well as the prohibitive cost of taxis and still no subsidy for disabled people. You ask these people if they have ever been involved in consultations or, or on public transport committees. They tell you they're on the Disability Stakeholders Group, the, Trans the Department of Transport's Accessibility Committee since it first began, their local PPN, the Transport Providers User Group. They are engaged. They have participated in numerous consultations with NTA and DCC. Well, my friends, the journey you have been taken on describes what I have experienced in the last two months and over the last, I don't know how many years, except for one thing. The verbal abuse from the cycle has happened about a year and a half ago. I have no doubt that every disabled person here today in, in, in present and online could add to that story. The list of barriers is far longer than, than can be covered here. But who is listening? Barriers to accessible transport are still there. Elderly and disabled people alike are being pushed off our streets or else are moving around in states of high alert wondering what's going to happen today. A situation that I experienced over the last two years that I never ever had to experience in my life before. The footpaths used to be safe. I think the biggest issue still is that we're not being heard. And yet I believe there are good people in each department and in state bodies who actually want to make it happen. So what's going wrong? Why in the interest of access are the right policy changes not being made and why are they not being implemented? There's lots of talk about consultation and people are being engaged with, but it would seem only so that various bodies can tick a box and say they consulted with disabled people. It was mentioned earlier that access is not just a tick box exercise, it needs to be inclusive. I say this, we feel that consultation is not successful because our input is more often than not ignored. Consultation is not an end in itself. If the impact of disabled people sharing their expertise and often bearing their souls in public places results in no change for disabled people, it is worthless and, and cannot be the basis upon which public funding is granted. Perhaps it is time for a different route. Perhaps now that we have the UNCRPD, it's time to have our voices heard in a different forum based on human rights. Beating the same drum in the same corridors of power is clearly not having the desired outcome for people with disabilities. And unfortunately, we say this, as we say this, we're perceived as the naysayers, the negative crew who come back and say, oh, that's not going to work. Well, that's because we need to be involved in the designs before things are designed at the very early stages, before decisions are made, and we need to be actively heard. The NTA, the Minister and the Department have been aware of the issues around bus stops and current designs, in particular, particularly in light of, of new bus connects in Dublin. They've been told of research, best practice, they know all this, what works, what simply isn't safe, and yet significant barriers are still being put out there and, and complaints are coming in all over the place every day of the week. Local authorities will introduce opportunities for active travel, referred to as walking and cycling, which is great for some. Sadly for us, it's all about the bike and the scooter. When on the path, when scooters and bikes are on the paths, they're clearly not our friends. They are in fact mobile barriers to accessible transport. We need our local authorities based on active listening to disabled people which includes safe active travel to develop suitable spaces for the non-cycling public so that we can get around, so that we can have independent inclusion, accessibility, and, and get to our, our, our public transport. The, some people retire, rely entirely on public transport and have no choice. We are not the same as other stakeholders. And I believe that actually, culturally, this needs to be recognized because I've heard people saying, we need to include all stakeholders. Well, all stakeholders are not in the same position as people who have no other option. The good news is 
that increased, there is good news, it's not all bad. The good news is that increased funding is being poured into retrofitting old train stations so that hopefully there will be less dangerous gaps between trains and platforms, better access and speedy repairs of lifts. Serious questions need to be answered regarding active travel and commitments to car-free zones. We heard Tony earlier talking about, you know, open spaces. For other people, there's a need for cars to get close to places. Otherwise, we're just excluded. So these zones, do they enable or further disable people who have basic human rights to access and inclusion and to barrier-free public transport? One elderly, one clearly enabling, sorry, one clearly enabling initiative in Dublin, which was introduced by Dublin Bus in 2008, has delivered over 11,500 travel, assist, um, travel assists to enable disabled people to become independent travellers in Dublin, is the Travel Assist Programme. It has been hugely successful and is now being rolled out by Bus Erin in Cork. My colleagues from Bus Erin will tell us all about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elaine. It's, it, it, it just reminds us how very important it is to hear the user perspective. That's something certainly within IDI and within a service design approach we would advocate for is how do we take that empathetic approach to understanding every user's needs so that we can bring that into every aspect of the design process. So thank you, Elaine. Um, she's already introduced her colleagues, Amy <laughs> and Eleanor. I will hand over now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eleanor and I'm one of two travel assistants with Bus Aaron in Cork. I am a white female. I am wearing my uniform from Basarin today. So it's black trousers and top with a red gilet. Um, so I'm just going to give a little bit of background to the travel assistance scheme. It was set up in Dublin um, through Dublin Bus in 2008 to support people with disabilities with travelling on public transport. It was funded by the NTA and initially started by carrying out 100 assists per year, but now it has increased to over a thousand, over a thousand assists per year. So the move to Cork. From September 22, the travel assistance scheme became available on bus air and Cork city services and on Irish rail commuter trains. And later it is hoped to be provided on the local link services in Cork as well. So how does the travel assistance scheme work? We support any person over 18 and the service is free. The main aim is for the person accessing the scheme to become independent with using public transport. We support people who have disabilities, older adults, and anyone who feels vulnerable using public transport and need support to become more independent. We support individuals from their own home to where they want to go, be it the workplace, their day service, or college. So how do you get in contact with us? So passengers can contact us on our customer service number, which is up in the slide now, but if you'll be, um, be able to access that on our website, and also the travel assistance Cork um, email at busaren.ie. So once we get um, your contact details, Amy or I will contact you. We'll be getting information about your journey, where you live, where you're trying to get to, and what your additional needs are. So the whole process is person-centred. Step three, the travel assistants, myself or Amy, will plan the route on public transport, taking into account any additional needs um, the person might have and finding the most convenient and safe travel solution. Step four, once the route is agreed, the travel assistance scheme service agreement is signed and both passenger and assistant decide where and when the assistant, assistance will begin. Step five, the travel assistant can accompany the passenger on their first five journeys to make sure they feel comfortable and confident. Further, further journeys can be arranged if required. Step six, the passenger completes their first journey independently or with the help of their parent guardian or the agency worker. And then they come back to us and discuss if they need further support. So now I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Amy, uh, to finish off our presentation. Thank you. 
Hello guys, my name is Amy and I, like Eleanor, am wearing a red Boss Aaron uniform with the Boss Aaron logo on it with black trousers. I have dark hair and I'm hoping to think I look 31 anyway because that is my age. Um, so today I'm going to start with a bit of um, input from our head of customer experience, Michelle Peacock, who is our boss, and how she brought um, the experience to Cork, the travel uh, scheme to Cork. So she was approached by Naomi Rooney from the NTA asking if she would like to set up a pilot scheme in Cork to mirror the scheme in Dublin bus. Michelle agreed, advertised the roles and got a great level of response with excellent qualifications. She offered the positions, sourced the uniforms, which you can tell are lovely. And for those again who are visually impaired, they are lovely, beautiful red <laughs> and black uniforms. Um, we arranged training then with Dublin bus and bus air and HR and the scheme was then launched in Cork. So then the process of setting up the travel assistance scheme in Cork from our perspective was we went, we came up here to Dublin, the big smoke. We did a week's training under the watchful eye of the lads in Dublin bus, the original experts. We then came back to Cork and adapted that accessibility practice to the services there. We did lots of route training. Um, we had to assess and learn the types of buses we would be working with. We had to figure out what way we would teach a wheelchair user to get on and off the different vehicles that are used in Cork, unlike Dublin bus. There are different styles of buses. Um, we then had to assess the different scenarios for different abilities on said vehicles. We had a launch day then on August 16th, and we had talked with many organisations and presentations that worked along with the word of mouth. So saying this, we had challenges and key learning. Okay, so the challenges would include different scenarios on the bus or outside it for different abilities. So as uh, Elaine was saying or, or a while ago, that you know you have to be able to go to and from, it's all planned. You need to have um, like for your journey from your house to your destination. So then with that, so we had to assess the wheelchair and buggy spaces on bus. For the example, there'd be two buggies and one occupying the wheelchair space. So what do we do in that instance? Scooters and their sizes fitting on the bus. There was also buses terminating early, causing confusion for all customers. There was street furniture, meaning it's not the bus driver's fault, just the objects that are in the area at the bus stop, causing inaccessibility for all types of customers. Footpaths being too low or too high, meaning it's not safe for a ramp to be put out and the customer would have to go to the next safer stop. No footpath at some bus stops. Unsafe pedestrian crossings. There was one route had four stops continuously that we did not deem safe for a person with additional needs. Having said that, these challenges have brought a learning curve for us both. We understand the many obstacles a person with additional needs has when getting to and from the bus stop and using public transport. We preempt most situations on an individual basis, having seen them happen to individuals while on route training. We have learned that different emotions can be felt when it comes to training. For example, a fear of busy environments, the bus not showing up or being on time, which is completely normal. We understand it can be hard for a person with no additional needs, making it that much harder for those who will have the additional needs. But the main thing that we have come to understand is that safety for us is paramount. And this underp underpins the training that we do. If it is not safe, we simply do not do it. So thank you very much for listening to us today. Super, what a fantastic programme. Great to see it rolled out in Cork as well. And then finally then, last but not least, to hand over to Susanna. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello everyone, thanks for having me. Now when everyone is really tired and wants to go home, you need to listen extra carefully because I'm the only person here, not a native English speaker. <clears throat> so my name is Susanna Lohr and I'm from, from Sweden, that's far away from here. And I don't know really what I'm doing in this panel because I have not been asked to talk about transportation. I would be happy to talk about all the research we've done in transportation, but I've been asked about talking about web accessibility. So now we're back to what we did before lunch and let me see if I can make this happen. I'm going to <clears throat> talk to you about a research project called Users Power the Web Accessibility Directive or You Power WAD. Um, yes, so we talked a little bit earlier about the Web Accessibility Directive and how that is implemented. So we have the monitoring agencies here in, in Ireland, it's the NDA monitoring, so that is kind of top down, uh, looking for uh, making sure that the public sector bodies do what they're supposed to do. Uh, and then we have the public sector bodies themselves. They need to self-declare their level of accessibility in an accessibility statement. And then we have the end users who can provide feedback. And if that feedback is not timely or well good enough, they can also complain. But really, I think these three pillars of the Web Accessibility Directive are only, um, well, the directive only works the way it should if all these three pillars are 
uh, enforced and kind of working together in, in a really good place. And unfortunately, according to what uh, Ireland has reported back to the Commission, uh, is similar to what many other member states have, have seen, is that the feedback is not yet there. So we have loads of really good end user um, ideas and, and, uh, and experiences about things that maybe not work perfectly well. And please do provide the feedback because feedback is a gift. And if you don't tell the public sector bodies that you encounter problems, they may not know it. It's not the responsibility of the end users to do this. Of course, it's the responsibility of the public sector body. But this is a really nice, good circle if end users will be constructive in their, uh, in their uh, feedback and then the public sector bodies can really use that in a good way. And I think this is what makes the, uh, the directive really special. I haven't seen this kind of legislation anywhere, so we can be proud of it. But um, <clears throat> we have uh, loads of, of end users who know a lot about accessibility and unfortunate, as we have heard here before today, in accessibility as well. But this is kind of an untapped source of knowledge that, that many public sector bodies and also the monitoring agencies not always take care about. So what we wanted to do in this research is to make sure that end users get trained and, and get knowledge about how to provide constructive feedback because, and I say this to all of you, it's here, this, absolutely fine to say, this website sucks. You're entitled to do that, but it won't help much, at least. So uh, we want to involve end users, we want to empower, empower them, and we want to train both the end users and the public sector bodies to, to take on the feedback in a, in a good way and actually do some action about it. So we have, um, together with the Synthesis and the Dortmund University and uh, the European Blind Union and also the European Disability Forum, Funka is now uh, performing or carrying out a research project during two years. It's from 22 to 24. We have got European funding of 265,685 euros. I need to say that is funded by the European Commission. Thank you. Uh, and what we do in this project is that we have uh, we have carried out a lot of desk research. We are not the only ones measuring this. Uh, also, EDF and others have, have realized that the end user are not really yet aware about the possibility, or maybe they have tried to provide feedback and nothing has happened, so they kind of get tired of it. So we have done a lot of desk research on how why users are not uh, providing feedback and what is what the barriers are maybe um, um, hindering them. Uh, we have done a lot of surveys on both uh, end user um, uh, knowledge and experience around this and also from the public sector bodies across Europe is this. And we have also done in-depth interviews uh, specifically with, with end users of different a variety of, of uh, disabilities and also in I think all member states, or almost all member states at least. And then we've also done validation workshops and so on. And we are, when the project is going into the next stage, we will also do some pilot trainings based on the uh, facts that we have found so far. So what have we learned? We are just um, kind of halfway to, through the first phase, so we still have one and a half year to go. Um, but the potential for feedback, of course, you need to have, you need to be aware that you have the right to provide feedback and you also need to find the feedback mechanism <laughs> because if that is not easy to find, then people will give up. And unfortunately, uh, according to not only our research, but also other research, not every public sector body uh, does have a an accessibility statement, it's not always easy to find, it's not always called an accessibility statement, and then when you're there, the feedback mechanism is kind of blurred or difficult to use, and that doesn't make it easier. So uh, it's also important how you, uh, what the kind of feedback mechanism, how it looks, what kind of service or support that you give to the users, because many end users think, I may not know enough about this legislation, I don't know what is in scope of this legislation, or I can't describe what is happening, I just know that it doesn't work for me. And I, 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 I'm not very technically savvy, so I, I, I don't know how to explain this. And, and therefore, the way you kind of talk to the users and, and how welcoming and, and open you are in the mechanism and how the service you provide, that will really make a big difference. So, and these are just some very um, uh, easy uh, kind of illustration so how it looks so we are we are pro providing uh, clickable prototypes that will be online when the project is is more mature but this is just one example and this is not possible to to read it's just some 
some um, headings and then uh, the idea to say that the kind of the easiest way or the simplest form of an accessibility statement uh, with a feedback mechanism is just to provide email and phone number. So that can be enough, absolutely. It's, it's kind of compliant to the law, but of course not everyone would like to have uh, to do it in this way. So the more channels you provide, the more likely is it that, that many different types and categories of users will, will actually use it. Then we have different kinds of forms. So you can have very simple forms with just free text, or you can have forms where you get a little bit of help. So for example, you can get asked what assistive technology are you using? What operational system do you use? What, um, how did this happen and so on? And kind of leading question and support within the, the specific form that, that helps the user understand what kind of information is, is important that I provide in my feedback. But it's also important we have found that uh, this is not um, all these details are not required and mandatory, but just if you happen to know the name of your assistive technology, then pre please provide it. But if you don't, then it's also okay to just say that I use a screen reader and I, I really can't remember the version and so on. That's also fine. Uh, but that will then require more interaction between the public sector body and the end user, of course. So, yeah, I have many examples there, but um, the results of this project, the end result of this will, will be a couple of, of different deliverables. So we are creating now a toolkit that uh, both end users, um, disabled persons organizations and other vocational training providers can, can use. And hopefully also the public sector bodies will be able to use the toolkit because we have put in there uh, all the kind of tips and tricks on how to make a uh, feedback mechanism more usable, both for the end users and also how to take care of the uh, all the feedback uh, kind of internally in the in the public sector body. And we are now creating the curriculum, and this will be uh, provided in English, French, German, and Swedish. And then we will do um, uh, pilot trainings and and create also best practices. So we are we are collecting 200 best practices from across Europe and kind of making these prototypes out of them. So they will all be presented in in kind of pidgin EU English, I guess. Uh, and we will also provide practical guidelines on how to carry out the training programs um, when uh, different organizations would like to do that. So that was a very quick uh, overview of that project. But uh, if you're interested in the, that research or other research we're carrying out, then please do reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. And um, we've, we've done really well. <laughs> we, we have been the fastest panel, I think, of the entire day. So thank you all very much indeed. We do have time for questions, which is fantastic. And David is going to join us again, I believe, um, from the US. I don't know if we can bring him up on the screen. Um, uh, uh, as we're doing so, I think, um, yes, here, here's David now. Um, again, I, I would like to start um, again talking a, a bit about uh, user-centered design, as we would call it, or uh, walking a mile in somebody's shoes or being more empathetic in, the, in designing the products and services, the places and spaces within which we all inhabit. And I think, Elaine, you've, uh, you've given us a very good example there today of uh, a user-centered experience. Would you say there are other, th what is the best way for everybody to understand better um, every user's needs. What would you say is the best approach to making sure that we are designing products and services um, or transportation systems or whatever they may be? Um, what's the best way of doing that for, for every user? I, I think we need to ask people. I think we need to include people from the very, very early stages. Somebody earlier mentioned user testing. Listen to the feedback you get. Um, make the most use of those people who are already invested in developing things. Like in Ireland, we have, you know, a good number of people who are involved in transport user groups. They give up their time. They're really committed to this. And there are people who sit on the boards of each of the, the disability trans the transport organizations. All, all of those people would be really happy and prepared and are contributing. But, but from the early stages, I think we need to talk to people. We need to find out. The other thing is, you mentioned feedback. Um, sometimes feedback is very difficult to give. Some of the websites don't, don't make it easy. And then people resort to making phone calls. And I, I spoke to somebody the other day as I was preparing for this. I, I did a bit of research on the phone. Um, and somebody told me of 
uh, a transport company. She wanted to alert them to an issue that had arisen. She was okay, she survived it, but she wanted to tell them that this was a, a dangerous scenario. And she was told, well, if you want to make a complaint, you have to put it in writing formally. But that's not, that, that's not user engagement that's constructive. It's not helpful. So. Yeah. I think that that's a very good point. And, I, and um, Eleanor and, and Amy, we were talking earlier as well about, you know, what's, you know, you're only one month into a travel assistance scheme, but the benefits of actually being alongside people and understanding their user journeys, is, are there things that you've found kind of surprising that have come come to light through your experience of going beyond a survey and actually being physically with somebody to be able to, to, to take that journey with them? Um, yeah, like I suppose it's just how we started on the 1st of September and by the end of September we were both, our weeks were full between the meet and greets and getting to getting out to meet people and figuring out where they wanted to go um, and actually starting the assists. So like I suppose the demand, it's, it's you know, like I suppose it wasn't surprising but I suppose you just didn't know how quick the uptake was going to be. And it was, it's really, really, you know, like, and we have a waiting list already of 15 people, you know, and that's a month and a half into it. So that was, yeah, one thing that, and obviously hearing people's experiences of how they've just been just so relieved to hear that they're, like, if it's a parent of their, um, of their son or daughter who doesn't have that much travel experience, um, and just building up their confidence and hopefully in time for them to travel independently. Um, and also like both uh, Amy and I come from social care backgrounds. We've worked with people with disabilities, um, mainly intellectual and physical disabilities, but like for us working with people with visual impairments and people who are blind, it's it's so much learning for us. So that's that's been, you know, huge. And also, um, yeah, like the um, hidden disabilities, which is something we're learning loads about and we have kind of background in this. So it's just about raising that awareness. And I want to again thank Elaine for her describing her experience because that's just invaluable and really gives an insight, you know, which is really, really important for us all to be hearing. Yeah. Yeah, Elaine, please do. Yeah, just just as you're handing it over, I think that you, you've both raised a very important point there, though, which is about how then do you capture all of this knowledge and how do we bring that knowledge forward and make sure that it is used and it is usable and it is implemented. Sorry, Elaine. Just just to add, uh, to, I, I really think it's important that people take on board the fact that access, inclusion, inclusive design, universal design, it's not static. So. Sometimes there's engagement at the beginning when funding is being looked for for something, but but things change, things go into disrepair. Often the issues that people have are, you know, down down the line a little bit. So I think ongoing engagement, not just at the start of a program or designing something, mm. is essential. Yeah, super. Thank you. And I think uh, David, um, it's important to bring you in at this point. Thank you for joining us from. The US, I, I, I can see him down here if you're wondering why I'm looking at the floor. Um, I, David, you, you've, you've 32 years uh, experience and obviously, you know, to, to Elaine's point there, this doesn't stop. You don't start with one, one uh, particular solution and then that's it. We've ticked the box and on we go. You've had 32 years of um, making change. You've clearly had um, some, some real successes there, which is fantastic from a legislative perspective to make sure that that change really happens. Would there be anything in particular that you would say we need to really focus in on? Where, where do we need to focus our, our, um, our, our attention in, in how we construct legislation to make sure that we can really have as big a, as an impact as possible? Well, thank, thank you. I think what we've learned is to have legislation that is as prescriptive as possible, spelling out rights and obligations with timelines and to have rigorous enforcement mechanisms. A thing we've learned from some European laws is to have a good market surveillance mechanism to track how effective the legislation is and if it needs to be modified. And if possible, it's also important to have provisions that are broad enough to stand the test of time. So for example, the ADA did not expressly cover the internet since the internet wasn't around at the time of its passage. So those are some things that we've learned. 
Super, thank you. I'm, I'm conscious it is an open Q&A session, so if there are any questions within the room or any questions on the Zoom, please feel free to put up your hand or there is a question there actually, thank you. Is there a mic? Thank you. Uh, hi, Elaine. Hi, everybody. Uh, basically, the one point I would make, and uh, Elaine would know why I've worked so well right, with, right, over the years as well in transport, uh, Martin, how are you, Elaine? Uh, well, you have to have a louder voice. Like, it's great we're all on these committees, we all put forward our points, but we're ignored. That's the point. We need to get stronger, we, get, we need to get more vocal. Like, uh, the, the, the cycle bus islands, basically. They're going in because, like so the cycle lobby, are very loud. The silver bus stops go in because they're more greener. But when we don't get listened to as much, so we actually need to make ourselves much more vocal out there and also get ourselves into the positions of power. Like, if we had somebody actually who was actually in the board level now of the NTA, which we did have for a while and we lost, and someone who was good or even maybe in a, a planner and engineer in Dublin City Council, we might get things done. But that, that's where the problem lies. Like we, we do know ourselves what we need, but we just can't get it out there to the general public that these changes are required. But like we get ignored when we, we get pushed aside. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Can I respond? Yes, please do. I really don't think we need to get into competition with the cycling lobby. I, I think we shouldn't be in competition with them. We have rights to access. We are entitled to be included. Universal design is, is there for, for us. And somehow we need to have our rights enforced. We need to exercise our rights. Um, and we, we really shouldn't have to be competing. There, there is enough space for everybody. And I think the best way is if we can somehow collaborate to to work together rather than 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 going against each other all the time. Um, but I I I know there are, there are tensions, but they do need to be resolved. We don't have other options. We do have rights, and I really think you know we need to take that somewhere. If it's not if it's not working here, we need to take it elsewhere. We need to we need to get change happening. Thank you. Sorry, Charlotte, do you mind if we just... Uh, Not at all. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having us today, but we have to make it back to Cork on the five o'clock train. <laughs> uh, so yeah. it's uh, quarter past four, so we're going to have to run there to get over to Houston. So thanks again for having us. And if you have any questions at all, direct them towards our travel assistance email, which we can leave here with the directors. And if you have anything at all, give us a contact and we'll be happy to get back to you, OK? Thanks again for having us. Thank you. <laughs> I, I will, if I may, just ask, is that, is that okay? Can I continue on? A... Oh, there's some Zoom questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, so this is a question for Susanna. Uh, so the question is uh, whether or not the monitoring body is informed when someone submits a piece of feedback or makes a complaint. And then I'll just throw in a question then also for David. Uh, which also comments about the fact that it's 32 years since the legislation was introduced and it seems as if there's now, um, I suppose, uh, issues around funding and whether, uh, so the question is, should funding have been provided to the transport providers from the beginning? Was the legislation without funding um, sufficient or insufficient? Mm -hmm. Okay. Congratulations, David. You need to remember all of that until I'm finished with my answer. But, so thank you for the question. Uh, it, uh, I need to answer like a politician. It depends because in some member states, there it's the same organization having to do with the monitoring and enforcement. In Ireland, the uh, NDA is the monitoring body, and then you have an ombudsman taking care of the complaints. So it can differ between the different member states. But normally, I would say no. The monitoring body will not know if um, how much feedback is provided by end user because that is something between the end user and the public sector body and but of course the public sector body may 
discuss that with the monitoring agency, but it's not something, at least not now, that most of, of the monitoring bodies have been um, controlling or looking after. It's not part of the monitoring methodology, but we kind of hope that for the next round of monitoring that they will also uh, discuss this and, and take up, because I think it's really, really important uh, that uh, the monitoring body also understands if the whole circle of, of enforcement works in a, in a good way. But very few member states so far have, have any kind of real data on, on this. So this is David. In terms of your, your question, um, the ADA was a civil rights law, so it did not contain any funding um, to implement. Um, and that was a conscious decision. Uh, when I when I talked about the, the the provision of funding for making key stations accessible, that's because um, you know there were a number of of stations that weren't required to be accessible. So this was an an attempt to kind of bridge that gap to to make. Um, funding available to um, to provide accessibility where accessibility wasn't required. So accessibility was only required for key stations. And this funding that I talked about for rail stations was for non-key stations that haven't been made accessible because they weren't covered. Um, but for uh, you know buses, for rail vehicles, um, I think that's been pretty successful. The one blemish was Amtrak, and I think that was because of a lack of oversight and enforcement as opposed to a lack of funding. Thank you, David, and thank you, Susanna, as well, for answering your, your difficult question. Um, we have time for one more question, if there is one there. Tony, thank you. Hi guys, thanks. That was a really, really interesting uh, presentation and uh, it, a lot of it strikes home uh, in terms of the, the access to transport and stuff. I don't really have a question, it's more a comment. Um, Elaine, it was really good to hear you, your, your, your presentation and uh, I've, I've admired you for many, many years and that, that still continues. As, as we said, I used to work in the, in the NCBI years ago when Elaine was, I was, on, I was on, on work experience back in 98. So that's it, that shows how long I know Elaine. But um, I think it's, um, you know, a lot of us have spoken today about kind of accessible areas in particular, you know, my, my own presentation on the Central Bank of Ireland. I know Terry mentioned that the, um, the new Salesforce um, building in North Walkey is also based on um, a, a universal design concept, so it's ultimately going to be a very accessible building. I know that next door to the Central Bank of Ireland on the other side, there is the NTMA building, which is also very, very accessible, using universal design principles, all that stuff. But in terms of getting to these buildings, um, it's, 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 this, is where the, this is where the kind of the, the, the breakdown, I think, can potentially occur. So you can have the most accessible, usable building in the world but it can be out in the middle of nowhere where people can't actually get to. So unless the transport comes up to scratch in terms of its accessibility and usability, these kind of these kind of areas of 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 of, uh, of note in terms of their accessibility or usability are, are somewhat orphaned and potentially unusable to people with uh, with disabilities. So all I say, Elaine, is thanks for the presentation. Thanks for relating your experience, and please please keep fighting good fight on behalf of people with disabilities to make the to make transport accessible to us all. Thank you. So that, that's the end of our panel discussion. Thank you all very much for listening and for uh, engaging with us. And I'll hand back to Dr. Aidan Harney. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, um, Charlotte, and to also David, Elaine, Amy and Eleanor in their absence and Susanna and gold stars for everybody in terms of the timekeeping uh, because we're not nearly as late uh, finishing now as I was worried we might be earlier in the day. 
so I don't intend to hold you, uh, but uh, I think it's very important that I get a chance to say something nice instead of just nagging people about timekeeping. Uh, because what I want to do is thank you all for coming today. And I want to thank our speakers and our chairs for fascinating uh, and wide ranging content that we've heard today. And I know there was a lot to take in. So our presentations will be available afterwards and also a reminder that the event was recorded. So in a few days when we get that up on our NDA website and our YouTube channel, you'll have the chance to dip in again if there's anything you want to have more time to absorb. I also want to say thank you very much again to Minister Rabbit for opening the conference and particularly for launching the new e-learning module that you've been hearing about, which is called Buildings for Everyone, the Central Bank of Ireland. And again, uh, give you a, a chance to look this up uh, and it's going to be available to access free of charge from the CEUD website, which is available at universaldesign.ie. But as you all know, an event like this doesn't just magically happen. So I want to do some thank yous uh, before we close today. I want to thank our ISL interpreters, Ella and Michael. Uh, they've been uh, working very hard uh, to translate all of this uh, rich content for everybody. Uh, we had PCR captioning, so thank you to Shane and Michelle for that. The Croke Park team, I hope you'll agree, have been really excellent today. So thanks to Fiona Cronin and all of her team. And Leo McKenna and his team from Avcom have been really fabulous in terms of seamless IT support uh, throughout the day. Uh, really comforting to those of us up here on the stage. Thank you, guys. But in particular, I want to thank my NDA colleagues who've put such a huge amount of work into organising today. Uh, so the project team was led by Marion Wilkinson, uh, but she was ably assisted by Naomi Oldenburg, Cleana Doherty, Heather O'Leary and Martina McTiernan. And as you'll have seen, there's a whole, uh, a whole host of NDA staff around who've been providing support and assistance on the day. And thank you to you all. Um, it was really very helpful and great to have your support on the day. And a special thanks as well to Roz Tamming, our Head of Policy and Research, and Jer Craddock, our Chief Officer of the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design, both of whom who have taken such a, an important role in, in guiding the whole event and ensuring that the content was as rich as it was. So thank you to you all. Uh, and very finally, this has been our very first hybrid event. Um, I think uh, people will have been familiar with the uh, in-person only option from a few years back. And I think we pivoted quite well to the online only option over the last couple of years. Uh, but now we're trying to do both. Uh, I'm sure there were bits and pieces where we could uh, get some learning for any future events. So please do feed that back to us. My colleagues will be circulating an evaluation form over the coming days. Please do take the time to give us any tips or any feedback uh, that we can benefit from in terms of enhancing uh, that experience. And for now, it just remains for me to thank you all again for coming. Thanks to all our speakers. Hope you enjoyed the day and wish everybody a safe journey home. Thank you.